One by one, Gustafsson picked the teeth out of the golden bath and popped them into his mouth. It has the crunch, he reported to Ren, who also came over for a snack. Gary dipped his head in and trawled out a great pool of teeth, shattering them with huge bites, sending a wave of wince through the rest of the guild. They were already on edge, having just heard a strange shrieking sound echo across the mountain. Nothing to worry about, coming in hot at 7 o'clock, Rick called from the window. Nuke had just finished hoisting the squirming bugmaster onto his shoulder. We've got the goods, grab a handful of teeth for the road and let's roll, the prince ordered. But it was not going to be so easy. Not only was Gary hogging all the teeth to himself, but the ramp exiting the citadel was crawling with a fresh wave of skin spiders. Thousand Guardians, time to surpass even Kral. We'll fight our way out and claim victory, Isaiah shouted, leading his troops into the mess of sharp, muscly legs and waving stomach arms. Nuke's goons fought at their side, and a path out of the citadel was opened up. After fighting in and out, many of the combatants were wounded, which slowed their escape dramatically. My prince, since you are able, you should go on ahead, Watchton said. We cannot let their injuries put you in danger. Who do you think I am, Kral? Nuke retorted. This isn't about me, it's about the Tomodaiki. No man left behind. Future girl, time to work your magic, my friend. Who is a girl? Azumi had prepared splints for just such a case as this, but after patching the army up as best she could, they were still crawling back east along the ridge. Isaiah suggested they solve it the Shek way. The Thousand Guardians applied some acceleratory dragging to any who lagged behind, and finally the group got out of the secret castle's shadow. They reached the edge of the ridge, but more skin spiders were climbing up the cliffs towards them. Some had thought they were all heading to the citadel to avenge their master, but actually they were zeroing in on the guild. More specifically, on one member of the guild. Even more specifically, on one piece of one limb of one member of the guild. Rick, being very kind-hearted for a being with no heart, tried to open the little door on his arm behind which he'd stashed the Bugmaster's mysterious ring, but it was locked up tight. Well, he tried, and there was nothing else he could do, least of all tell everyone what was actually happening. They finally made it off the ridge, but by now the sun had disappeared below the jagged horizon. Nuke did a quick roll call before they went down the hill and back to that red river, but one of his hired hands was missing. No man left behind, Nuke demanded. Ain't a man, he's a skeleton, Sandor said. Damn, you should have seen what happened last time humans started talking shit like that, Rick commented. He and Nuke found the injured skeleton some ways back, and pulled spare parts from Gary's bag to shore up his leaking tubes and sparking fibers. By now it was pitch black, and the rest of the guild nervously stood around the two surgeons. The sky was completely covered in rain clouds. The only light was from their own lanterns, but the darkness was so maddeningly thick that the orange flickering stretched only a few meek meters in any direction. The sound of rain on rock was easily mistaken for a horde of skin spider feet padding towards them. It was a tad miserable, suffice to say, and that's just for those who weren't trying their hardest to hold their blood in. Finally, the downed bot fizzled back to life. Oh, c'est la vie! Oh, wait, ah, there it is, he said, suddenly jumping to his feet as if there wasn't a big claw hole going front to back through his chest, and indeed as if there wasn't a pair of pairs of hands fiddling away inside the hole. It was much less exciting than it sounds, I assure you. They finally got back on track, but then Gustafsson caught a whiff on the wind, and they all hit the dirt. A gang of skin spiders came up the track they were about to go down, and started feeling around in the darkness. You could hear them scritching at the rocks, and occasionally making a faint raspy sound to one another. Both of the hivers seemed to recoil when they heard it, and whispered to each other about it in private. They do feel the connection. They are not running, Gustafsson was heard saying, prompting a disappointed sigh from Ren. Whatever that was about, the good news was that the skin spidery sounds faded away for a while, and the gang managed to scramble down the cliffs towards the river. 
There were a couple of spiders patrolling the bank, but they were quickly dispatched. Alright, you've done it before, now do it again, Nuke said. Into the water they went. The previous time there was daylight, and they weren't carrying wounded soldiers on their backs, and, last time, there weren't any skin spiders honing in on their secret signal. At least they can't swim, Izumi commented. Red Rick emerged on the opposite bank. They can breathe underwater, though. Not saying I saw anything down there, but, uh... Well, the truth became extremely clear, extremely quickly. The skin spiders were standing on the riverbed, jabbing up with their front legs at the floating chunks of meat. Fucking hell! Swim for it! Nuke shouted, but even those who made the crossing quickly found the east bank swarming with more fleshy pilgrims. Chaos ensued. Those who struggled from the river were immediately beset by spiders, and as they became injured, they dropped the already injured folk strewn across their backs. Then they grappled frantically with the skin spiders' rubbery hoof hands and pointy feet, all, may I remind you, by fading candlelight. In the fray, Nuke was struck across the face and tumbled to the ground, letting the Bugmaster roll away from him. When he regained consciousness, the whole crew was across. Once the Thousand Guardians had splashed their way over, the battle had been won, but now the sum of the guild's injuries had gone beyond what Acceleratory Dragging could deal with. Or perhaps Acceleratory Dragging had gone too far, as Wadston demonstrated in his attempts to get a thousand guardian named Kang out of the water. He pulled and heaved, strained and wheezed, and then, just when it looked like he'd done it, he tripped on a fallen spider, span around, and launched poor Kang a good ten meters back into the river. My man, so packing, Nuke said, wiping blood from his mouth. I'll deal with it. Rick said, stomping back into the river and catching Kang just as his armor pulled him down to the bottom. Everyone appeared to be alive, but now most were hobbling along with the heavy weight of injured comrades and buckets of teeth anchoring them all the way. In fact, only Nuke wasn't carrying another person on his shoulders, and that was the biggest problem of all. Give me back my ring, you bandits! the Bugmaster shouted from behind them. He emerged from the darkness unarmed, but that didn't look like it was going to stop him. I need that ring to get back at the bastard who did all this! Ring? What? Nuke said. Before anything else could be said, Red Rick gave the Bugmaster the stick, and he fell down unconscious. Raven lunatic! Old ring distraction line! Oldest trick in the book! Trust me, I seen that book in the first damn edition! Now let's get the fuck out of here, shall we? They did, with the Bugmaster safely riding on the nuke train again. The good news was that recovering from the skirmish at the river had taken most of the night, which Nuke had thankfully slept through, and so at last it was possible to see where they were going. They followed the river north, killing the odd lone spider still seeking its calling, and then turned east to at last climb out of the crater. There was one last hurdle to overcome, and it was the tallest of all. An iron spider was pottling about among the rocks as if looking for something, and Nuke's mercenaries decided to try and kill it to get something valuable out of this whole misadventure. This was a poor decision. Three were killed before the machine gave up the ghost. These non-biological spiders were powerful, which was something the Bugmaster was keenly aware of. As the guild finally reached the top of the crater, the first clue to the Bugmaster's real goal emerged. This here is the Ashlands, Izumi said to Nuke. She was holding up a piece of paper she'd taken from the Citadel. Or THE piece of paper, it is accurate to say. The records say it's where the Second Empire carried on the longest time. People don't go there, since, you know, the whole you never come back thing. But the giant robot crabs, that's Second Empire stuff. And if there's anywhere you dig up a load of that, it's there. This guy was up to something the Ashlanders didn't like, I bet. What, killing Shek? Wrangling spiders? Nuke asked. Dunno. Maybe... I'll look up some stuff once we're back home. <laughs> so you're sure you're gonna make it? Of course. I would say thanks to you, but the worst part was when I thought you were dead, so not really. You thought I was dead, and you claimed to be so clever. I see you're still being a piece of shit. It's only because I like you. Uh, oh! Well, that ended the conversation quickly enough. 
Rick was right to think that they were quite the clueless pair, and he was also right to think that it was better if this whole connection between the Bugmaster and the old Skeleton Empire was forgotten. So he let the conversation go unpunished. He never did work out how to turn off his microphones, you know. At least the journey down the mountain was a quiet one. No spiders assaulting one's body, and no awkward sunderous stuff assaulting one's processors. Things weren't so quiet once they reached Last Stand. The Shek guards flipped between being speechless and screaming like maniacs. Such was the emotion stirred up by the sight of their arch enemy in defeat. At last the crew could take a well-earned break, getting their wounds sorted out properly, catching up on lost sleep, and cashing in on bets made with the humbled warriors in the bar. Chubba, one said to Els, it seems there was a warrior in you. Flatskins, bugmen, and an old one. I'll never understand your company, but I understand victory. This one is yours. So saying, he returned to Els the bucket he had yanked off his head on a previous visit. Els's wide grin disappeared behind the rum-stained wood. By early the next morning, the guild was on the road again. All were back on their feet, save for one Tiffany of the Thousand Guardians, who left a foot in the Bugmaster's hideout. Of course, their next destination was Admag, and the barracks of the Stone Golem, where for Isaiah, the greater battle was yet to come. They've defeated the Bugmaster! A guard at the gates shouted. Within moments, the whole city was jostling for a view of the heroes and their prey. The crowd implored Desire to take the news to the Queen, and it was imploration much needed. Man, I'll go with you. Let's sort this out, huh? Nuke said to him. Prince Dashino, I don't deserve it. But I can't say I don't want it. Let's go, Isaiah replied. He pulled his helmet off and marched with Nuke to the royal barrack. The rest of the crew were told to wait outside, joining the cheering crowds. The warriors inside were silent, simply staring at the Bugmaster hanging over Nuke's shoulder. Nuke hauled him up the stairs and found the guy he'd spoke with before, the Queen's Hand, Bayan. Word was given and is kept by all of us, Bayan said. A few guards carried the Bugmaster away to be imprisoned, then brought Nuke a Garu pack filled with strings of cats. 100,000 in all, the street value of over 100 kilograms of brown. Your company has proven itself. You will be honored as an ally of the Sheik, Bayan went on. Good, good. Empire needs allies, I expect. Empire? You are from the United Cities? <laughs> yeah, kind of a big deal over there. This man shares the same rank as I, Master, Isaiah said. Bayan looked his eye in the eyes, for the first time in over a decade. The memory was as clear as day. Bayan wiped his horns with both hands, looked at the sky for a moment, then bowed to his eye. Then we've truly hit upon a strange thing here, he said with a laugh. What can I say? At least the holy nation won't like it one bit, which means the queen shall. You should go, both of you. She awaits the hero of the day, and she wishes she could have seen you sooner, Prince Isaiah. At the other end of the barrack roof, Estata was gazing out over the crowds in the streets. She was looking about with narrowed eyes and crossed arms. The thing she was looking for now found her. Isaiah, she nearly whispered. Queen Estata, it is I, Isaiah, known as Whitehorn, the masked Shek, or pale skin. I return to... Ah! His eye was cut off by his feet leaving the ground and the world around him suddenly spinning. It was Astarta's doing, of course. I'm so sorry, she said. Yet at once I am unforgivable, my boy. Let it all be purged from history, lest I be buried under it. Now, really, it, it's okay. I've held my own. Which only proves my guilt. As I flying bull, what good is an excuse? My queen, my mother, it is all right, Isaiah said, but he couldn't keep his composure. As I has done more than his duty, right? Nuke said. I think it's time you ended this whole pale skin thing, whatever it is. He's the prince here, 
No ordinary one either, because he's here the hard way, you know? And look, he's got a dog! Look into its eyes and say you aren't going to let Master go home. Astarta took a look at Choco, then a longer look at Azaya, who was held up in front of her face. Then she carried him over to the roof edge and held him up in the air like a baby. Behold, she called out, this is White Horn Azaya, first child of my house and prince of our kingdom. He is from the mold of Kral and carries that honor with him always. I was wrong to turn my back on him. Hear this, the curse of pale skin is no more. Narco does not scorn this prince. He is favored more than any of us, so his deeds have proven. Let the lies wash away like the great sea and reveal the nourishing land below, the bedrock of our kingdom, our strength. It shall always be said that the curse was lifted this day and the stolen prince returned. Hail, Isaiah! Amid the cheering, Isaiah was returned to his feet and gave an uncomfortable wave to the people below. His people, it could be said. Associate with him! Gustafsson was calling, standing on Wren's shoulders. Bravo! A fine example indeed, Wadston commented. Now that's a swell reception for a man of the world, Rick said. If only I could be so lucky. If only we really could forget. Made my own bed, huh? The victory slash reunion party commenced. Istata received the whole TCM Plus guild as honored guests, showering them with a variety of chewy cactus lumps and rum so volatile that a drop of it seared a patch of paint from Rick's face. What was he doing drinking rum? It might not do anything for a skeleton, but he had an image to cultivate, you must understand. Joining the party was the kingdom's existing heir, Princess Seto. So, you're older than me, she pouted. Yes, but don't worry, my kin, this is just a visit from me, as I said. Setting things straight, then I'll be back to business. What's your business? Oh, you know, corpse carrying, map reading, adventuring, really. With those outsiders? Yes, yes, only recently, but more's the shame. What a time we're having. You don't... is it really better out there? Better? <laughs> Depends on how you look at it. Uh, for you, Kin, I would say you'd best keep up with your reading and weights. No place for a toddler. But it's something else, this world. The kingdom's just the start of it. And the Shek, too. Just smoke from the mountain. I'll show it all to you one day, I promise. So, you'll come back? Of course. I didn't grind my teeth down over this whole affair for just the single visit. <laughs> I intend to be a fully-fledged prince of the kingdom. But a prince in the fashion of one, Nuke Tashino, a prince of the kingdom and beyond it. After all, that's where we need to be to get this planet back on track. I don't know what you're talking about. You'll find out once you're old enough to help him, Istata said. Mother, I, I think Seto should remain with you. Nonsense. My children are going to make the world a better place. I've listened to your empire, friend. Sounds like you're a cut above the usual crew. Except, I don't really understand this brown bread thing. Oh, it's... Well, just don't eat it, no matter what anyone says, all right? Royal treasury's empty enough with that bounty, eh? It's not really honest work, but it's one step at a time, the path to righteousness, you know? <laughs> Overall, we have something resembling a happy ending here. That's one exiled prince, unexiled. Just nuke to go. Well, Gustafsson is kind of a prince, or he was, or something, so maybe two to go, if he wants. And what was Red Rick muttering earlier? Well, the more immediate concern was finding a shop that sold spare legs and going back to the drawing board on Nuke's sidelined mission to get a decent flow of drugs into his dad's house. As it just so happens, their exit from the Shek Kingdom quickly revealed the solutions to both. <laughs>